Alright guys, how's it going again today? Um, you always question people ask, who's the best? And why are you the best? And the question is, what criteria can we use to measure who's the best? People ask, you know, what's the best country? What's the greatest country? Well, you know, we'll say we are, but why? And as we analyze different uh, topics, different places, things, that kind of stuff in class this year, we'll have to have some tools as to measure, you know, why something is the best or why something we rank something uh, a certain way, especially in terms of a group of people. I will use some modern day equivalencies to uh, make this happen. So we have to be objective, okay? We have to be able to use data to analyze modern day countries and ancient countries that matter too, and figure out you know where they rank, how they rank. Um, you know, we're figure out what uh, how we can analyze data. We're be using analyzing countries' data and developing questions about those countries from that data. So what kind of factors do we have to know to analyze countries? Number one is population. You know, how big are they? How much population do they have? You know, are they getting are they growing? Are they shrinking? Is that our big one? What's their government like? You know, what kind of government do they have? Do they have a very stable government? What type of government? A very fair government? Those kind of questions come up here as well. Money-wise, right? What's their economic system? You know, are they doing well? Or are they not doing well? Uh, what kind of system do they have? Question will come up a lot. Natural resources. What natural things does this country, this place, civilization have available to itself? What kind of things is, are out there for this uh, group of people, this political state, to use um, and to get rich off of or to help themselves go forward? And lastly, literacy. Literacy obviously means reading and writing, but it could also be the question of, you know, how smart people, what kind of education do they have? So about population first. Lots of numbers here, guys, okay? So we'll take a look at some numbers, some terminology, figure out, uh, you know, how things are. So first thing is population growth. Basically means the difference between the number of people that are being born, the number of people dying, divided by 100. You're going to get a percentage out of this thing, okay? So if we have 99 people being born, 95 dying, it'd be 3 out of 100, a 3% growth. The wild card here is immigration. When people move from place to place, like we talked about in the idea of, of movement, of people movement, um, population does change. You know, so you have the birth rate. Number of people born for every 100 people. If I have five live babies born for every 100 people, I have a 5% birth rate. So I know for a fact that I get five live babies for every 100 people born. You also have your mortality rate. That's how many people die for every 100 people, for people out there. So I know that every day I've got five babies being born, I also have four people dying every single day. I'm going to see kind of, you know, how much my population is growing that way. Uh, a lot of places around the country, around the world, are growing pretty rapidly right now. Uh, what place do they grow in this? Well, one big thing is healthcare and sanitation. Getting sick. I mean, people get sick. You know, they don't have hospitals or modern day medicine. They don't last very long. Uh, if you ever go to an old cemetery, you'll see lots of graves of small children. It's very sad. Um, but healthcare wasn't very good back in the day. And a lot of people, if you got sick, if you got tonsillitis, or if you got strep throat, that could be at you know back in the olden days you know that could have been a death sentence right there so as we develop new ideas of healthcare, new ideas of sanitation to limit uh disease and infection those kind of things it plays a big role in population going up uh you you see this a lot in the industrialized versus the developing world industrialized meaning uh countries that are developed have modern industry versus developing which is more based upon uh agriculture and farming and what kind of modern day things they have available to them uh, you know, if you have an industrialized place with modern day plumbing and all that kind of stuff and sewage systems, those kind of things versus the developing world where you may have to walk, you know, five, ten miles to get, you know, water, that plays a big role, big difference. Um, and you'll see that in terms of the infant mortality rate. This is like a big number, okay? Basic question is how many, you know, babies for every hundred that are born die. You know, there are some countries where 10 out of every 100 babies may uh, die before the first year of their birth. Right now in the United States, um, less than one baby per 100 die uh, before the first year of birth. As we know that because of our health care, our technology, our sanitation, more kids are living past that first year and becoming adults later on. Uh, morbidity is our term here in terms of people, people in poor health. You know, as our health care goes up, you know, this number here goes down and this number will go up because, yeah, we we'll have people living longer but they may be living longer in poor health, whether it be heart problems or cancer or other issues like that, uh, that people are living in in poor health. Um, 
we're looking at the idea of life expectancy. How long does the average person live? Uh, and men and women are different ideas. So typically women will actually live longer than men, traditionally, um, you know, for a reason, okay? Uh, but, you know, a lot of factors could influence that. The biggest one being the idea of health care. The more, the more health care available, the longer we live, and uh, that kind of stuff. We measure through what's called the population pyramid. So you look at the pyramid here, uh, pretty simple. One side, the pink side, in this case, or the lighter side on this side, is female. The other side is male. It tells me the ages over here. And a little bar graph tells me what population. So looking at, at this bar graph where my uh, orange, my green circle is here, I know that, you know, of ages 80 plus, I have a lot more females than males. Ages 10 and 19 is pretty equal. And you can tell by the shape of this graph um, if your population is increasing or not. So look at this graph right here, right? I don't have a lot of people living very old, but I have a lot of people that are, be, that are very, very young. And this is a rapid growth because as this goes up, they're going to have babies and it's going to be an even bigger triangle. And you're going to see that triangle increase and increase and increase. And so it's rapid growth because you have a lot of babies being born right down here, a lot of young people. As they get older, they'll make more young people. And more young people, you see very, very rapid growth. Here you see slow growth because, yeah, are there more and more people being born? Yeah. But at the same time, more and more people, more and more people are being born. Uh, it's a lot slower, a lot smaller in people than you see in the rapid growth over here. Well, this one over here, this one here, zero growth because see, remember people are dying, older people, so they're being born. So as one of them passes away, another person is born to replace them. And so when it looks like almost straight up and down here, that's going to be zero growth. Lastly, we have the idea of negative growth. Notice there are less people being born than there are old people. And so here we're actually going to see less and less people being born because, for reasons, they're choosing to have babies. And so the natural population in this country is actually going to go down because less people are being born means next generation, less people are being born, and we'll see this inverted triangle to what you saw over here. And these population pyramids are really, really important to kind of tell what a country is doing, how a country is growing, and, you know, and what that population is going to look like in the future. So here's the world today. You can see like a lot of areas in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, uh, some parts of uh, Asia have very, very rapid growth to them. The United States, we're pretty much slow growth. You know, we're growing, but pretty slowly. We go to Europe today. A lot of Europe actually has negative growth. People are choosing to either have kids later on in life or even not have kids at all because of the life choice that they're making. And so we kind of see big changes here uh, in these three areas. A lot of factors play into this. So like I said, disease is a big one. If you live longer because of lack of disease, those kind of things, technology, making life easier, and increasing your chance of living. Um, you, know, you can find ways to uh, replace heart valves or new technology to keep you alive longer. Uh, we have san or he babies alive longer for that matter, like NICU and those kind of things. Sanitation, uh, the idea of, you know, of things being clean, less germs around, wars. Wars take out wars take out people all the time in terms of, of, uh, of, uh, um, you know, large casualties, those kind of things. Uh, you have the idea of money. You know, more money available, the more health care can happen as well. And the idea of culture. You may just make, be making choices, uh, to have or not have kids. And so all those things play a big difference in this. Looking at the same thing here now too. Uh, we have the idea of population density. Population density is going to be. How many people are crammed into this small location, all right? So this map over here, we measure by square mile or square kilometer. And how many people are crammed into that area? So notice on this map here, you see some areas, big cities, are super, super crammed in here. Other areas, not so much. And the big problem comes down to natural resources, right? This could be, you know, whether it be water, food, that kind of stuff, or it be jobs and money. And the more people are packed in an area, the less those resources will be available. And you're going to have people starting to, you know, maybe do things to get those natural resources. Could be crime, could be violence, could be other problems, whatever, um, disease, etc. But more people cram into an area, typically the more problems you're going to have. And we also measure the economy. Um, and we'll look at some examples of this in class as well. But uh, we typically measure economy a couple different ways. A couple terms you're going to have to know to measure an economy. So I'm make you guys do this in class. One is called the GDP. So GDP is called gross domestic product. Essentially, the value of all things made within a country's borders. Domestic means here at home. And so if I take the value of every single good and service, every, every single thing created 
every single service provided, goods being physical things, services being like, you know, a waitress at a restaurant, I'm going to get the value of all that put together as my country's GDP. At the same time, we have gross national product. Not all U.S. Com companies are located in the United States, somewhere like, you know, Vietnam, Indonesia, whatever, okay? If we take the value of all goods uh, made by a company that's headquartered in the United States, like Nike or whatever, we measure that total amount. Gives, that gives me the GNP. I can also say, hey, per capita, that means what's my GDP per person? So what's the value of every single good being made per person here in my country? I can tell how just how rich, how powerful a country might be by measuring those economic factors. Now we talk about you know levels of economies, you know, first world, second world, third world, whatever. You know, what's the US, what's China, what's India? We have different terms now. One term would be a primary country. If you're a primary country, you're just gathering the stuff you make other stuff out of, the raw materials. So I'm going to gather the lumber, the minerals, all that kind of stuff, like from Africa or from uh, a lot of developing countries, the raw materials, right? Farming stuff comes from that same place too. Uh, so let's be a primary country where your primary thing you're doing is getting raw materials. If I'm a secondary country, I'm making stuff. I'm China maybe. Maybe one country produces the oil, they ship it to China, they make it into plastic, and they make it into cheap McDonald's toys, whatever, okay? But if you're making stuff as your primary way of, of, of uh, earning money, that makes you a secondary country. You have tertiary countries where you provide services. The United States could be considered this because you know we have a lot of business people, bankers, doctors, etc., whatever, that provide a service. And so if your primary thing that your uh, country does is services, you're tertiary. Okay? You're doing stuff for other people. You also have quartionary as well, which would mean that you're dealing information. So instead of just providing a service, you're actually thinking up new ideas, doing research, doing all kinds of stuff to make new and better things. Now, countries don't, can't do a lot to help themselves out here. It depends on the people a lot of times. They can provide infrastructure, though. So like nation states, countries, if you will, they actually build things to make the country run better. They might build roads or railroads or airports or ports or all these different things to help shipping or help industry or help a country develop more. And those are some of the things that a country can do. I kind of keep these things going. Natural resources. Okay, for the DNR, right? Department of Natural Resources. Think about what things have economic value. It could be lumber. It could be animals. It could be tourism. It could be a lot of things, right? And it's really important because if you have natural resources, you can make money for that country. For example, in Wisconsin, we were once a huge lumbering state. You know, Wisconsin's covered the trees, and they all got cut down to make things out of it. And we still have a big lumber industry yet today. If you, can, if you have natural resources, you can make things or sell to people to make things as well. Um, you know, some of these resources are renewable. Things like trees, okay, even seafood. Uh, they can be replaced naturally. They might need help from us. Okay, but you can replace these things naturally sometimes. That does help a lot in terms of what we'll call a renewable resource, right? It can also be non-renewable. For example, there's only as much iron in the world as there is in the world. You can't make new iron, all right? You get out of the ground, it's your, eventually going to run out. That's a non-renewable resource. People question petroleum. You guys, you know, as you get older, get start driving, all that kind of stuff, you got to pay for gas. Is petroleum, oil if you will, that gas is made out of, is that a renewable or non-renewable resource? Well, you know, petroleum may have dead animals that have, you know, decayed stuff over time. It's actually considered a non-renewable because it takes so long for petroleum to develop. Um, you know, there are certain things that are never going to run out ever, like solar power and wind, that kind of stuff. Um, geothermal power, they're never going to run out, okay? Talk more about it later on. Literacy, read and write, is measured if a purse can actually code and decode. Can I, can I look at this line and know exactly what it says? Can I actually read the words? Do I know what it means? No, but if I can read the words, okay, and I can write out letters and stuff, that means I am literate. You know, if you can recognize that word, it's measured. Understanding it, not so much. And think about what does a high literacy rate tell you about a country? Well, it tells you that it's educated. And maybe it'll tell you what kind of job stuff they can do in that country. A lot of factors could limit it too. I mean, you know, the amount of work you have to do, the availability of education, the availability of technology, all those kind of things can definitely play a role in countries and how they go forward. Guys, take a few notes. This. We're going to use this in class. We're going to do a little project with it, look at some modern day countries and also apply these uh, to the ancient world as we compare it to the modern world here in class. Thanks a lot for your time, guys. I appreciate it. I'll see you all in class.